Welcome to Dr. Ramos' bird sanctuary. I've got no lot of kids, but I've got a family of blue-faced honey eaters. There are four or five of them. Five of them. They're the initial family had five, but I thought that some had been killed because there were only three for the last couple of years. And this one's interesting because it's making the juvenile sound. Oh, it does have a, yeah, you can tell the young ones because they have a green face rather than a blue one. And those are the juveniles. And they go cheap, cheap, cheap all the time. Quick, quick, quick. It sounds just like the uh, tweet sound on a Yamaha keyboard. So I have a hypothesis that I'd like to share with you. I've written about it in an article on the evolution of music and the human voice box. Now it has been noted before by uh, biologists that uh, chimpanzees and gorillas do not have a larynx that is capable of generating the complex speech that human beings have. You know, my hypothesis is that it came from human beings copying the sounds of birds, which they do for two reasons in main, the main. One is to attract them for hunting, and the other is as the inspiration for singing the songs of birds. And this bird here, delightful, lively little bird, is a Manorina melanocephala. And it has, it's a social honey eater. That's another one. It's a social honey eater. And they peck the eyes of the runt of the litter and sometimes blind it in one eye. But I figure that there's an evolutionary reason for that. And as we now know, birds evolved long, long time before human beings did. Archaeopteryx uh, was flying around or gliding 150 million years ago. And then other birds evolved into dinosaurs, sorry, other dinosaurs evolved into birds. But dinosaurus, dino means terrible and saurus means lizard. So they were named as terrible lizards, but in fact, I strongly suspect that dinosaur behavior was more similar to the behavior of birds than it was to that of lizards. These birds have become quite used to me. They're called noisy miners because they have a loud alarm call. 
other sits, but they don't just uh, do it when they are around, they also <laughs> See, they fly right past me. They also have a very gentle call that they, a song. That's another their song. Then they have an early morning song. It's answering it. I uh, just heard a pigeon. You can tell pigeons because of the sound of their wings. They're fascinating birds to observe. I was told by a woman at Griffith University who fancies herself as a bird expert that you shouldn't plant nectar-rich plants like grevilleas that are known as bird-attracting plants. That's a grevillea over there. They say not to plant them because they attract these birds, Manarinas, which she said chase away the other birds, including the blue-faced honeyeaters. But I found that to be absolute rubbish. They don't chase away the blue-faced honeyeaters, they socialize with them. And they get very excited. They get excited by other birds. They used to be afraid of the uh, megalopods, the, what they call a scrub turkey, even though they're not turkeys, that we saw earlier. Now I figure that the megalopods which are family all of their own, are uh, related to uh, Matabarosaurus. That's my hypothesis. Matabarosaurus, which is a Gondwan and dinosaur. The only sound that the megalopod makes, megalo means huge, and pod is foot or pod. Yeah, the only sound that they make is ooh. They go ooh. And they're mound builders. They build mounds, communal nests which are tended by the males and you can get as many as 30 eggs laid in there and the males test the temperature and control the temperature of the mound by uh, sticking their head in it. Fascinating. It's thought that, that they can regulate the gender of the, of the brood. See how close this bird is. They're very friendly.
So anyway, she said, this woman, I forget her name, that these birds chase away the smaller birds. But they, in fact, the smallest birds that come to the gardens. And they were nesting here when I moved, uh, moved here ten years ago, eleven years ago. And there are about thirty of them in the bigger family, but they rarely get all together. That's only on very special occasions. They do get around by hawks and cats. Then they mob them. But they don't mob the blue-faced honey-eaters and they don't mob the kookaburras either. Now I've also noticed that the blue-faced honey-eaters follow the kookaburras around and talk to them. <laughs> and they also chase each other. They play chasey, that's how they learn how to fly. They take a bit of food and fly off. They also collect food to feed their young. The whole family does it. The siblings, the older siblings. Yeah, delightful birds. They have like my irrigation system. Anyway, that's a little bit of observation of my birds without the parrots. The parrots have all disappeared. I haven't had, didn't have a single one today. I don't know whether that means that they got poached or whether they're off doing something. Okay, that'll do for one. My short. So thanks for watching Dr. Romish's Bird Sanctuary. <laughs>